Uh, hopefully everybody got a handout. I had a, a, another handout that I prepared tonight. This one just has key information to help you understand the book of Revelation. As we all know, the book of Revelation is a very different kind of book. And um, the interpretation that I'm going to give, which I'll give on any book that we study in Scripture, is based upon the uh, historical truths, based upon sound exegesis, which means studying uh, the passages in context and the book in context. And those things that are mentioned on that sheet there are things that we've already gone over for the most part. They'll help you understand the background, when it was written, why it was written, who it was written, the nature of symbolism in the book, what numbers mean, all that kind of stuff. And if you don't understand that, uh, if you don't get that, that's why it'd be good to keep that sheet with you and reference it through this whole study of Revelation that's going to end in the, uh, the last week in January of next year, Lord willing. Um, that will help you to keep on track with what this stuff means, especially when we get to some stranger chapters, and there are plenty of them coming up. When we get to chapter 13 or chapter 20, for example, and we start talking about the 666 and 144,000 and the thousand year reign, which people have butchered, it'll be handy to keep in mind that numbers are used symbolically in Revelation. They are not to be taken literally. And we'll see that pretty plainly when we get to those chapters. Um, just kind of a follow-up to what I talked about Sunday night. You remember the first two chapters, we're going to be in chapter 4 tonight. The first uh, first chapter was the opening vision, and then chapter 2 and 3 that we talked about Sunday night were these letters to these seven churches. These are real churches here in Asia Minor. Just to give you some scope here, you know, uh, the Black Sea is right up here, so that means Russia is over here, and Europe is over here, and there's the Atlantic Ocean, and we're over here, <laughs> the United States. Uh, so these were real churches, and that's who this letter was written to. And they're real people, just like us, with families and kids and, and with lives, and they were very concerned about what is going on. That's who the book of Revelation is written to. These seven real churches, house churches, churches were not like this back then. They didn't have these big church buildings like we have, and you know, 300 and something member church like ours is. Uh, we're talking small little churches that met in somebody's living room, more than likely. And uh, he's trying to give them, uh, he's trying to reveal some things to them. And as I've said before, the book of Revelation is meant to reveal, not to conceal. Thus the title of the book, the book of Revelation. And uh, as we studied Sunday night, and it's pretty obvious if you've been reading in your Bible along with us as we're studying, and I hope you have. That's how you're really going to grow. Some of those seven churches that he wrote to had some real serious issues, didn't they? I mean, some of them were just flat out unfaithful, and there was all kinds of ungodliness going on in some of them. But I think it is important for us to be reminded that Jesus did not give up on any of those churches, even the worst of them. And so if the church is worth Jesus staying with, it should be worth us staying with. And I say that today because we live in a culture today to where sticking with the church has become about like it is sticking with a marriage. If you get tired of it and you find a better option somewhere else, just ditch it and go to the next one. I mean, I hate to say it, but that's, don't mean to be crass, but that's the way our society has, that's the way it works. That's not Christianity, brothers and sisters. Uh, when we become a member of the church, it's meant to be like you're getting married, which was meant to be a permanent deal. And that means commitment. And those of you who have been married a long time, like Jakey and Judy have a 50th wedding anniversary coming up a week from Saturday. Uh, though I don't know, I haven't talked to him about this, but, you know, I've been married a pretty long time myself. I'm sure there's been some not seeing eye to eye on everything all 50 years, but they didn't walk out from each other. Uh, what godly people do, what Christians do in marriages and in churches, they don't just walk out, they work it out. I'm not talking about in exceptional circumstances. There are situations, some of you have experienced it, where there's abuse and just horrible breaking of the marriage vows going on. I'm not saying that you should stay there in that kind of a situation. Or with a church, some churches are abusive. But for the most part, just because you don't like the fact that we have pews instead of chairs, <laughs> that's not a good reason to leave a church, brothers and sisters. And I, I say that tongue-in-cheek, you know that's kind of a joke with us, but uh, there are people that leave over stuff like that, and less than that, that's ridiculous. 
Uh, that's someone who doesn't really understand the ABCs of Christianity. Uh, Christianity is a commitment. Being a part of a church is a commitment, even when you don't like everything that goes on there. Think about it just for a second. This is just logic. You know, there are 300 and so there's going to be, you know, on a normal Sunday, there's about 300 people here. There'll be more this Sunday, hopefully. But normally there's 300 people here. Well, if you got your way all the time, what about all the other 299 people? Does it matter that they get their way? You see, pardon me? And fortunately, we have a church where, you know, we have good people here and people have gone along with that. But, uh, you know, we just need to keep that in mind. There's going to be a point at, at some time in the future where you don't like everything that happens here. You don't like what I say. You don't like a decision or something the elders have done or somebody, somebody said something to you in the hall or whatever. And to get mad over something as simple as that and leave is not what we see in Scripture. So if Jesus sticks with these churches that had very serious issues and he's walking in the midst of the lampstands, don't you think we ought to stick with our church family? I thought I'd get an amen on that. Y'all can say amen. Okay. Um, I'm going to read. We're just going to uh, focus. There we go. This is the picture I want. You'll see why I picked this picture here in a second. Hopefully you have your Bibles. We're going to read uh, all of chapter 4. It's only 11 verses. It's a short little chapter, but it's powerful stuff here. This is actually the real beginning of the visions that are going to happen in Revelation. This is the one that sets the sets the stage and the groundwork for everything else that's going to unfold. And he says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking with me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature is like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them had six wings. They're full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and they worship the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and they were created. I think here in the, ver in the very first verse, after this, which means he's transitioning from this led, these letters to these seven churches that we talked about on Sunday night. After this, he's making a transition to the real visionary part of the book. He said, after this I looked, and there was a door that was standing open in heaven. And the way I picture it, of course, I don't know exactly what this is like. He's given us pictures because we can't really describe it exactly. But it's almost like this. God knows these seven churches are really under the gun from the uh, oppression of the Roman Empire. These Caesars were demanding that you worship them as God. 
And if you did not, they could very well take your life. That was beginning at this time when Revelation was written. As it says on your sheet, I think Revelation was written sometime between the years 69 and 79 during the reign of the Roman emperor whose name is Vespasian. I could be wrong on that, but it's somewhere in that time period. And he is pointing to a time, remember he's writing about things that are going to take place thousands and thousands of years in the future, right? Please tell me, you know that's not right. I've said this over and over and over again. The book of Revelation is not primarily about the future. That is not what the book is about. People say it's about the future and it's about the end of the world and all that. Nope, that is not what the book of Revelation is about. What the book of Revelation is about, it's about Jesus Christ. That's what it says in the first couple of verses. The revelation of Russia and China and the United States and thermonuclear war. That is not what it says. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is Revelation about? It's about Jesus Christ. And he's writing about things that were soon to take place, as he says in the first couple of verses. And in case we forgot, like a bookend, at the end of the book, in chapter 22, verse 6, he says it again. These were things written to these Christians who lived in 69 to 79. He's saying, I know things are kind of bad right now. Oppression is ramping up, but it's about to get a lot worse. And he's talking about when another emperor named Domitian ascended to the throne. And he reigned from the year AD 81 to 95. And when Domitian got on the throne, oh my goodness, it was bad. Real bad. That would have been a bad time to live. And he's warning them about things that are soon to take place. There's an emperor coming soon. And you better get ready because he's going to ramp up persecution and you had better have decided ahead of time whether or not you're really serious about worshiping and serving God or not. And so this voice which summons John to uh, this voice which summoned John undertook to show him what's going to happen soon and his readers and us it wasn't written to us. This is important. No book in the Bible was written to us and Revelation was not written to us. But it is for us in principle. And so his readers and us are meant to perceive that these grim events that he's going to be talking about that threaten them, they are not to be understood in isolation from what he's about to reveal to them here in this chapter. He wants them to understand, yes, things are about to get bad. I mean, real bad. Can you imagine, and this actually happened to real people just like us, they didn't have church buildings like this, but if they were in somebody's living room and their members of their, you know, 40 or 50 members of their church were there singing songs of praise to Jesus and studying, you know, what little few letters they had. They didn't have books at the time. But uh, studying his word and trying to do his will, and then all of a sudden some Roman soldiers come in and they say, How many of you here believe Caesar is Lord or Jesus is Lord? And if you didn't say Caesar's Lord, they'd haul you off and you may never see him again. Can you imagine that? I mean, this is serious stuff. You've got to decide which way you're going to go. And so he wants them to understand that when things like that, they're starting to happen now, but it's going to happen all the time soon. When things like that happen, I want you to understand, church. I want you to understand that those events that are going to happen in your real life are not to be understood in isolation from what I'm about to reveal to you. Keep in mind what I'm about to reveal to you. It'll make all the difference in the world. And so I think what he's going to show here in these chapters is before we look at the chaos breaking out around us, they needed to know that then and we still need to know it now. We need to look at what's really going on above us. I mean, so many times we just look at what's going on and around us. So many Americans spend their day by turning on Bad Morning America and listening to, you know, everything is bad, you know, the world's going to end, they're going to impeach Trump, in case you haven't heard, you know, all that lingo, and this is, the stock market's falling apart, and then the next day it's great, and there's trade tariff wars between China and the United States, and one day, oh, it's terrible, and it's going to cause her, you know, we're going to go into a recession, the next day, oh, the economic indicators are up, they never can make up their mind, it's always bad. We always find ourselves looking around, and they were doing the same thing. And he says what we really need to do before we look around is we need to look up and we need to see what really is going on. So what Jesus is trying to do here, he's trying to give this church some perspective 
on reality because things are not what they appear down here. That was true then and it's true now. And the main image that dominates these chapters is this throne. There's a throne in the center that he sees. Exactly what it looked like, of course, we have no idea. But there's a throne here in the middle. And in order to survive what's going on around you, what John is trying to say, or what God's trying to say through John, in order to survive what's going on around you, you need to really know what's going on above you. If you really understand and get it, and this is important for us, if we really understand what reality really is, and I mean spiritual reality, if we get what's really going on above us, it helps what's going on around us to be a lot more tolerable. The reason people give up and suicide is on the rise in our country is people don't have hope. And if you listen to Bad Morning America all the time, I can see why you don't have much hope. But if you take a look at what's going on above, which is what he's trying to do in these chapters, it makes all the difference in the world. As we just read in just a second ago, what he sees is behind this door where he gives them kind of a peek into reality, there's a throne. This is interesting. This is just one of these weird little facts that I found. The word throne is used in the entire New Testament, all 27 books, is used 60 times. Guess how many of the uses, usages of that uh, word are in the book of Revelation out of 60 total in all 27 New Testament books? 45 of the 60 times of the use of throne are in the book of Revelation alone. alone. This is a book that's all about the throne of God. And to those who are living under the shadow of oppression of Caesar's throne and what he could do to them, the one truth that mattered above all other truths is that there is a greater throne above that's far greater than Caesar's throne. They needed to hear that. I think we need to hear that. No matter how bad things get down here, and you know what? Things can get bad. Some of you in here right now might be going through something, not like a Roman soldier is going to come and execute you or threaten to, but you, I know there are people going through very difficult situations. What to help you get through is hope. And I'm not talking about pie in the sky hope. I'm talking about stuff that's real by looking above at what is really going on. And what he says in verse 2, when he saw this throne, here's what's really important. There is someone sitting on the throne. That was true then. They needed to know that. The universe is not random chaos. We are not spinning around just accidentally. All these factors happen to come together in some cosmic accident. And the universe is just, just all just a big accident. Aren't we lucky everything is just right here for habitation on planet Earth? That is not what is going on. That's what the world would have you believe. That's not what's going on. There is somebody on the throne. This is the control center of the universe. And there is somebody sitting in that chair. And of course, obviously, this is God. God has a plan for his world and for his universe, and that plan is going to be accomplished. Nothing can thwart it. Now, let's admit it. Sometimes down here it doesn't look like it's going too well, does it? <laughs> Would you agree with me? I look around and I'm like, well, it sure looks like it's off course quite a bit. Well, it may look that way, and it does look that way. But you know what? Ultimately, God's purposes are going, to be are going to be accomplished. And there is no nation, no individual, no power, no philosophy, nothing that is going to thwart that. And that was good for them to know who are being oppressed by the powerful Roman Empire. And it's good for people to know today. Look what he says in verse 3. He says... And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow. Let's stop right there. Remember, I've kind of gone out of my way several times because I really want people to understand the book of Revelation. Where does he get, not most of it, but all of the language and imagery that he uses in this book? Where does he get every single bit of it from? The Old Testament. Where have you seen a rainbow 
before. Does that show up anywhere in your Old Testament? The very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the story of Noah, and that rainbow, he says there was a rainbow around the throne. He doesn't mean this literally. He's using pictures to get people to understand something. In the first century Jews' mind, they would have autom automatically gone back to the covenant that God made with Noah when he put the bow in the sky and God made a promise. I'm covenanting with you and I'm always going to keep my promise. I'm never going to flood the world again with water. And around here right now in Texas, we can believe it. There have been times when we were kind of, you know, not too sure about it, right? But God always keeps His promises. That's what He is reminding them of. And He's, he's wanting them to know who are under severe oppression. Guys, I know it looks bad. I know it doesn't look like I'm going to keep the promises to take care of you. But trust me, I always keep my promises. And then He says... Not only, there's this one big throne in the middle right there that's emanating a light and there's thunder and there's lightning come out of it and all these colors and everything. And here's what seems weird to us. Around that throne, there's 24 other thrones. And on the thrones, there are these 24 elders sitting on those thrones. What did we say about numbers in the book of Revelation? Numbers are what? They're not literal they're not literal. They're figurative. They mean something. And the number 12, 12 times 2 is 24. The number 12, as, you'll, as, as I mentioned in our introduction a couple of weeks ago, and I think is on that outline, the number 12 is a big number in the book of Revelation. It's a big number in Scripture. There were how many tribes of Israel in the Old Testament? How many apostles did Jesus pick? Twelve is a number that simply represents God's people from all times. And twelve times two, I think what he's saying, all the people from Old Testament times, all the people from New Testament times, these are God's people who are around the throne. No matter what has happened to them down here on this earth, they may have been persecuted horribly. Their life might have been snuffed out by some evil, oppressing government. But look where they are now. They're not only around the throne of God, they themselves are sitting on thrones. And remember when I explained kind of a big picture what the book is about, if you see people wearing white and gold, is those the good guys or the bad guys? Good guys always wear white. When black and red start showing up, and I was, somebody told me this Sunday night I was wearing black and red. I didn't do that tonight. That's good. When you see black and red showing up in the book of Revelation, those are the bad guys. But you have these 24 thrones and 24 elders. Uh, what he's representing, he's talking about the 12 and times 2, the 24. That represents the people of God from all time. Spiritual completion of the old and the new. And why he says elders, I'm not exactly sure. But these are the people of God. And I want to think about something just for a second. This is something that we never talk about. I've never heard a sermon on this in my entire life, and I thought about preaching one, but it's, it's, uh, it'd be kind of a little bit complex to put together. But notice I mentioned a second ago, not only are these, there's these 24 people around, the, thron around the, the big throne where God is, but they themselves are sitting on thrones. What do you think that means? What's God trying to tell us? A reward. A reward. I want you to think about this for a second. The Bible is actually full of this kind of language. If you, when you read like 1 Corinthians, for example, you know, it's only, just do yourself a favor and read that uh, while we have a few days left in this week. It's only 16 chapters long. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, there's language kind of just sprinkled. It's not in, all in one big dose in one place like I like it, but it's kind of sprinkled throughout. Uh, when we die, if you're a faithful Christian, you're saved by the grace of the Lord. That's the only way anybody is saved. Not only do we get rewarded, but we also reign. There's language. It's what it says. In fact, when we get to chapter 20 of this book, of the book of Revelation, that so-called thousand-year reign of Christ, go read that again. Chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. What it is, it's, it's just, I'm just reading what the text says. It's the thousand year reign of the saints with Christ, which is what it says. 
And exactly what that's going to look like, I have no idea. I understand that God is the ruler, the one who reigns over the whole universe, but there is some kind of sense, and exactly how that's going to work out, I don't know. But there are many passages in the Bible, like 1 Corinthians chapter 5, for example, says, don't you know, or chapter 6, rather, he said, don't you know that you will judge angels? He's talking to a church like ours. You're going to judge angels. You're going to be in charge in some kind of way. How exactly? I know God's ultimately in charge. I'm not saying we're going to usurp the throne of God, but we're going to be reigning and have authority. Exactly how? I have no idea. Because <laughs> it doesn't say. But it's going to be crazy good and crazy cool. And it's something that you, you certainly don't want to miss. Uh, so this, this rainbow and these, this is all a reminder of God's going to keep all these promises that he's made. These 24 thrones, these represent the people of God and these elders on it. God is blessing them and no matter what their life has been like here, ultimately, you're not only going to get rewarded, you're going to reign with God in some kind of way. Uh, look in verse 5. Chapter 4, verse 5. It says, From the throne, as is depicted here pretty well, I think, came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire. Where? Once again, where does he get all his imagery and his symbolism from? If you were a Jew and you knew your Old Testament well, which they certainly would have, where have you seen rumblings and fire and lightning and shaking and all that? Where have you seen that before in your Bible? The tabernacle. I'm especially thinking of Mount Sinai. When Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, go read the book of Exodus. Uh, it's uh, somewhere between chapter uh, like 14 and uh, or chapter 16 and 20, right in there. Ten Commandments are given in chapter 20. So between 16 and 20 of Exodus, you're going to see this, the, the Mount Sinai is rumbling and it's smoking and there's lightning and there's all this. That's exactly what he's saying. This is the, represents the presence and the power and the dynamic presence of God. This would have taken these readers back to the story of God giving the Ten Commandments. And I think what he's saying is... Uh, the throne of God rests on God's immutable moral law. It can't be changed, regardless of how our society thinks they can change it. Uh, God's throne rests on His unchangeable law that was first given at Mount Sinai and uh, permeates all of creation. And then, I love this. Look in verse 6. And verse 6 says, And before the throne... This one big throne in the middle where God is sitting. Before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass. Clear as crystal. Uh, I don't know how many of you have lived by the ocean before. Laura and I a long time ago lived in Miami, Florida. And we used to, we're the only ones at our church who ever went anywhere, but uh, they all lived, they all were born there and lived there, and they never went to do anything. We're from West Texas. We're like, water, wow. We were always exploring stuff and doing, there's a lot of cool stuff to do in Miami. I used to know my way around there, but I'd hate to go there now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, usually when you go out to the, to the ocean there in Miami, you know, like any ocean, uh, you know, there's, there's ch a chop out on the, on the sea. And, you know, there's, you know, two, three, four foot waves or whatever. But I remember this one time we went out there. And I mean, it was as smooth as glass. And we had another guy from West Texas there with us. And we're like, are, we, are you sure we're in the ocean? I mean, it was, you know, usually how you can kind of body surf at the ocean. Some of you probably do that. We like, you couldn't, no body surfing this day. It was as smooth as glass. That's what he's talking about. Before the throne of God, as, he, as I think is what he's trying to picture right there, before the throne of God, there's this sea, and it is as smooth as glass. Uh, in the Old Testament, and to these Jewish readers who knew their Bible well, the sea was a place of evil. If you go read the book of Daniel, which, once again, I mentioned a lot of the imagery in Revelation comes from Daniel. If you go read Daniel chapter 7, and then you read Revelation chapter 13, which is where John gets his imagery from in Revelation 13. He gets it from Daniel 7. The sea is the place where these beasts 
who represent these empires. That's where they come up out of. The sea was seen by them as a place of evil. In fact, if you read the very end of this book, Revelation 21.1, when he's talking about, I saw a new heavens and a new earth, he says in chapter 21.1, and there was no more sea. I don't think he means that literally. He means there's no more evil for things to arise up out of. And I think this is important. When you look around us in our world today, this was the case with them and it's the case with us right now. When you look around us, it looks like everything's just coming apart and there's random chaos and there's just a bunch of nonsense going on in this world. Doesn't it look like that? And there's hatred and there's evil and there's disruption and there's corruption and there's all this turmoil going on all the time. It's important, it was very important for them to know then, and it's very important for us to know. But before the throne of God, everything is just as smooth as glass. God is not concerned at all that things are out of control. They're not out of control at all. It just looks like it because we're too used to looking around instead of looking up. That's what he's saying. And then after this, he says there are these four living creatures. Where does he get his language from? Gets it from the Old Testament. If you go read the book of Isaiah chapter 6 and Ezekiel chapter 1, it's going to sound almost exactly like this. Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1 have these four creatures and they're listed right here. They're, one was like a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. And if you refer back to that little sheet I gave you there and what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, remember the numbers are representative of spiritual truths in the book of Revelation. They're not literal. I don't think he means they're literally these four creatures. These four creatures are representing something. Four in the book of Revelation is representative of things that are earthly. In other words, this is God's creation. This is representative of all of the creation of God on earth. That's who these four living creatures are. And then I think it's very important. Later on, it says here in Revelation that these 24 elders, what do they do? They all bow down and they are worshiping the one who is on the throne. As I mentioned, I think in a sermon not too long ago, it's kind of surprising, I think, most people to discover this, but there is more worship language in the book of Revelation than any book in the New Testament easy, and it's not even close. There's as much worship language, probably next to the book of Psalms, in the book of Revelation as there is in any book in the entire Bible. Because these people and God's creation who really do have proper perspective now that they're in the presence of God, what do they do? They don't complain about their plight on earth when they were there. What do they do? All they do is they bow down before God and they worship Him and they say, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. They don't complain. They don't argue. They don't talk about why did this happen and that happen. They just want to worship. Uh, verse 9 says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, our Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, because you created all things. And by your will, they existed and were created. They were praising God because He is the self-existent creator. God is self-existent. He has always been. And in the book of Revelation, He is described time and time again. He's described as Him who is, who was, and who will be. And the problem with first century Rome and the problem with modern America and every other country in the world is people get the creator and the creation confused. Paul said right here in Romans 1, he's talking about how people in the first century had gotten their minds distorted. And he said they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie 
And they worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. The way it was manifesting itself in the first century, they were saying, we want you to worship Caesar, a created man. That's ridiculous. And those who had the proper perspective, they refused to do that. Some of them were killed for their faith, and guess what? They went right into the throne room of God. Now today, we're not being asked to worship Caesar in that way, but there are people all across America, millions by droves, who are worshiping created things rather than the Creator. God gave us things to enjoy, not to worship. And by things, I mean, for example, like sports. I'm sure, you know, God probably likes sports. <laughs> he made a world where he created it. It's not to be worshipped. God created sex. It was his idea. It's not to be worshipped. So many people are worshipping drugs and money and power and created things rather than the Creator and what these four living beings who represent the earth and God's creation are calling us back to. Don't do that. The only one who is truly worthy of worship is God. The great lie is that these created things can take the place of the Creator. That was the lie then. That Caesar somehow could take the place of the Creator. That's the lie now. That you fill in the blank XYZ created thing can take the place of the Creator. They certainly cannot. Uh, that's why he says in Colossians 3, when Paul, another apostle, is writing this, he says, Since you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. It's so important, and this is what John is trying to get across to them with this first vision. Look above. Look at what is really going on. I mean, how, wouldn't you agree? I mean, wouldn't everybody in here agree? One of our biggest problems is just we get too earthbound. We just get too focused on things that are going on down here and all our little issues we have to deal with. Would, would you all agree with that? Even during a time of worship, for example, and let's make a concerted effort this Sunday. Let's, none of us do this. I'm not condemning anybody. or I mean, I get in the habit of doing it too sometimes. We're, we're going to come here to worship God. Our minds should be on, well, I wonder, I hope that meal that we're going to eat afterwards is going to be good. Our minds shouldn't be on that. Well, I hope the Cowboys play good. Today, tonight will be tonight, Sunday. I hope they play good tonight when they play the New Orleans Saints. That shouldn't be what our mind is on. It should be on worshiping God. Our problem is we get our mind set too earthbound. And what Paul says right here and what John is saying in Revelation is, get your mind centered on things above. That will solve an awful lot of problems. And so once again... As we close this chapter, what, what dominates this chapter is everything in this chapter is centered around the throne. The throne is what is the main object that is in the center. It is that which everything else is around it. Everything is giving glory and honor and praise to that which is on the throne. There's no question what is central and around which everything revolves. There's no question about it. Um, we've all heard of the word eccentric. Think about that word for a second, eccentric. It's, that comes from two Greek words, which a lot of our English words do. They come from two Greek words stuck together. Centric, as we know, means center. Ek in Greek means out of. It means out of center. Or crazy. It's out of center. We've gotten out of center. Uh, what we need to ask ourselves, sometimes when we get out of center and we end up worshiping created things rather than the Creator, we all need to ask ourselves, is the thing with which I am so enamored right now and have been worshiping, is it glowing? Does it have lightning coming out of it? And has it been around forever? That's a good question to ask. Is it glowing? Is it eternal? Is it self-existent? And does it have lightning coming out of it? If not, guess what? It's not worthy to be worshipped. What this really is here in Revelation chapter 4, this first vision is a call to see the big picture for what's really going on. Because when you see what's really going on, it makes life bearable because it gives you hope. Let me just close with this illustration. Uh, before I tell the illustration, this is funny. Uh, 
Uh, in, in another town where we lived, there was a gentleman who was in World War II. He was actually at the Battle of Normandy, June 6, 1944. He was on one of those landing craft ships that they let the, you know, down and were facing machine gun fire from the German entrenchments up on the hills and everything. He was there and he went back for the 50th anniversary on June the 6th, 1994. They had a big ceremony over there with the president at the time. And a lot of these people who were still alive went there. And this gentleman who was in our church had went there the second time in 1994, 50 years later. And I was talking to him when I went to visit him one time. And I said, well, you know, I was real interested in that. I said, wow, that's interesting. I said, tell me what the difference was between the first time and second time. This is funny. Here's what he said. He goes, it was a lot quieter the second time. <laughs> I bet it was. But uh, on June the 6th, 1994, at this 50th anniversary of D-Day, some news channels were interviewing soldiers who were there. And they were trying to get their perspective and just, you know, to, get, to hear what they would have to say. And one soldier who was on one of those ships who stormed the beaches said on that day back on, in 1944, he said, well, looking around him from his perspective at sea level, when they got off and those doors went down, he said, I looked around and he said, I thought there's no way we can win. And then they interviewed a pilot. Jim, you like this. Air Force, right? They got the good perspective. They interviewed a pilot who was flying above the battle. And he could see, all he could see for as far as he could see was just thousands of ships, the largest invasion that there's ever been on planet Earth. And he was interviewed from flying over that battle, and he said, well, from my perspective, what I can tell is there's no way we could lose. That's what Revelation is trying to get us to see. Right here at the very beginning, before all chaos breaks loose, and trust me in Revelation, if you've read it, there's going to be chaos breaking loose. It's going to look like, whoa, what is going on? Before all that happens, he wants you to keep coming back to this. Guys, remember the big picture. The white team wins. Get on the white team. Don't get discouraged. Don't be deceived. The white team wins, and it is worth it no matter what you go through. Not only will you be rewarded, but you will be sitting on the throne with God. How cool is that? Let's close with a prayer.